<laughs> Listen to this. One source said that Trump's VP pick could be influenced by the fact that he likes people who are rich and have hot wives. <laughs> well, at least he's taking this seriously. That's not so <laughs> he really means it. Those are the only two questions on the forum. Look, are you rich? How hot is your wife? <laughs> anyway, don't be surprised when you're here. Please welcome my new VP, Jelly Roll. <laughs> All right, Donald Trump has been narrowing down his list of possible BK VP candidates. He confirmed in an interview last night it seems that he will announce his running mate at the GOP convention next month. His campaign sending vetting materials to several prospective candidates in recent days, among them North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, also Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio and Marco Rubio of Florida. CNN reports that Vance and Burgum are accompanying Trump on his West Coast swing this week. Uh, so, I mean, David Chalian, where are we on the Veep Stakes speculation? Who's up? Who's down? What do you think? I mean, we are definitely in a new phase. There's no doubt about that. This uh, request for materials, uh, this is amping up, and we're in the window where that would uh, make sense. I do kind of love if indeed. Trump does reveal the pick at the convention because for decades it's always been like, are the conventions have any news anyway? They're just messaging vehicles. That would be an actual like news event at a, at a Republican National Convention, and that would be kind of great to cover for us. It would be a little Trumpian, right? Like a, to go ahead and do that. A real Make dramatic reveal. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But but news nonetheless. I mean, it is interesting. Donald Trump has kind of revealed for us in an interview last month where he said that he really thinks people vote for the top of the ticket and that the VP is not really a major factor. I tend to agree with that analysis. I think he's probably uh, right about that. But nonetheless, these are the two oldest men seeking the presidency. And so looking at who their number two is, a heartbeat away from the presidency, is something that I think in this environment, uh, it may not be a thing people vote on, but I do think it's like information that voters are going to take in as part of their overall calculus. Yeah. So let's just refresh, I mean, because this is, and Sarah, we can talk about this too, but uh, Donald Trump is obviously uh, choosing among a group of people who, while they have all turned around and become very interested, apparently, uh, in taking on this kind of a role with him, didn't actually start out that way. Let's just um, play that tape. Would you ever do business with Donald Trump? Uh, I don't think so. I would, I just think that it's important that you're uh, judged by the company you keep. There's a movement to sort of gloat over the fact that the elites were right about Donald Trump, right? I'm a never Trump guy. I never liked him. You all have friends. You all have friends that are thinking about voting for Donald Trump. Friends, do not let friends vote for con artists. I mean, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> look, it's brutal, but this is this is the world I have watched uh, most Republicans. Uh, in, I don't know what J.D. Vance thinks never Trump means, actually, because it means never. Um, but look, they all <laughs> bent the knee, and there's nothing Donald Trump loves more than taking these people who once opposed him and making them bow down and beg for a job. I will say uh, it's interesting. I, I really thought Trump was going to pick a woman, ultimately, yeah. but we have seen multiple of the women who sort of would have been top contenders kind of self-immolate on the tarmac, you know, like uh, Christy Nome had huh. the unfortunate incident well. with the dog, and Katie Britt had her unfortunate, very strange response uh, after the State of the Union, and so they're no longer on there. Lee Stefanik's the only woman sort of still in the mix. You know, Donald Trump does like the theatrics, though, of some of these things. I, I always kind of thought he would try to pick somebody who was um, newsy, but the more I watch this, the more I think Marco Rubio makes sense for him, in part because he'd get to humiliate him just a little bit by making him change, move out of Florida so he could do it. But also, it does bring normie Republicans on side in a way that Donald Trump has mostly done anyway, but for people who are, it's, it's the equivalent of taking Nikki Haley without uh, taking somebody who actively ran against him hard in the primary. But do you think, to, for the normie Republicans, that's your term, not mine. <laughs> um, do you think, though, like if he, whoever he picks, their script is going to have to change and fall in line with Donald Trump's script, which then doesn't make them on sides with the normie Republicans, or does he just 
kind of let them be so minute in the coverage of his campaign. I just, it's also the interesting, like, arc of the Never Trumpers. Like, most people started, like, okay, I'll vote for Trump, and then slowly progressed to Never Trumpers. These people reverse engineered it, and to J.D. Vance, like, started a Never Trumper, and the wor the things he continued to do that was worse and worse and worse, he was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm good with that, you know? Yeah, but you have to understand something about the Republican uh, psychology here, which is that, um, Many of them are not, uh, like, Marco Rubio codes Normie. It doesn't, sort of doesn't matter what he says. He's a mm. pre-Trump politician that for a lot of voters who are really uncomfortable where the Republican Party has gone under Trump is kind of like, okay, that makes me feel better, even when what he says now is very much in line with Trump. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to turn out of this because there is a critical group of voters this election cycle that we are constantly talking about, and they're the so-called double haters. They say they won't vote for Donald Trump, but they're also not committed to voting for Joe Biden. And Sarah Longwell spoke to nine of these double haters. Uh, and this is uh, what she writes about many of them. Quote, they had familiar stories. They supported Trump in the past as the lesser evil. They couldn't stomach Hillary Clinton in 2016. They were lifelong Republicans who couldn't imagine voting for a Democrat. Some of them remember watching The Apprentice and admiring Trump for his perceived business savvy. But the events of January 6th and general fatigue with Trump's antics have made these voters not very likely or not at all likely to vote for him again in 2024. Uh, Sarah, bring us inside the room here. I mean, what did you hear from these people? So we talked to these voters the day after Trump's conviction, and we'd specifically screened for people who had voted for Trump twice, but really didn't want to vote for him again, because I view this as our persuadable group of voters. Uh, the problem is, is that they're, they're out on Trump. They're just like, I can't vote for this guy again. He's too toxic. You know, he's a, he's whiny. Um, but then they're like, but also I can't vote for Joe Biden. The reason we talk about the double haters is that these are people who, uh, and it, it is, it is, it's different, right? Because we have two functional incumbents. The persuadable set are people who don't want to vote for either person. And right now, it's tough to actually get uh, a good look at them in the polling because for a lot of them, they're like, yeah, third party. They're like third party mm. curious. Mm. But then if you ask them anything about RFK or tell them something about him, they're like, oh, you know, like it's <laughs> it, maybe, maybe I don't like that. And so they're just and they're not that tuned in either. They just no, know cute, that yeah. they don't like them. And so they're not paying that much attention because they know both these guys and they're like, Ugh. but when push came to shove in that group, five of them went for Biden which was really interesting to me. In the wake of the conviction. In the wake of the conviction. And they did say that the conviction mattered to them, although for a lot of them, they also, like, January 6th was a red line for a certain kind of voter who isn't going back to Trump. Mm -hmm. And it, it just is. Yeah. Uh, David, I, I'm, I'm, as we're kind of having this conversation, I do want to bring in, um, there's some new swing state polling out from Fox News mm -hmm. this morning. Uh, and as Sarah is suggesting, there might be you know, a lot of voters out there who, after January 6th, just can't do it. There are some striking numbers in Virginia, which, uh, you know, Biden won, I believe, by 10, 10 points. points. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Look now it shows it 48, 48, obviously registered voters, uh, margin of error, 3 percent there. What what is this? Yeah. And, I, you know, it is not the only poll that has showed uh, Virginia within the margin of error, but it is the most recent and reputable one that we have. Um, that's an astonishing number to see, and that, that is going to send some chills in, uh, in Wilmington down the spine of the folks working uh, there. Because you, if you look at where the Biden campaign right now is targeting and advertising, Virginia is not currently on the list. Uh, if there's another poll, if this is not a one-off and we see this repeated, trust me, they're going to start advertising Virginia too. When you're adding states that you think are already sort of in your corner, the, the road to 270 is getting a lot more complicated for you. Uh, right now, the, the thinking in the Biden world is that the easiest path to 270 is repeat the blue wall, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. That's hang on to that Omaha area, single electoral hood, Nebraska, and you're there. I mean, that does it. You can lose Nevada, Arizona, Georgia uh, to Donald Trump if you win that. But a, a state like Virginia, if that gets into the real toss-up category, your your math to 270 becomes a lot yeah. more complicated. If we're talking about Virginia on election night, I mean, the map is the map has changed. Yeah.